40 years ago, a madman escaped from a mental hospital. A man in a white mask. My grandmother was right. The boogeyman was real. It's over. We can't hurt anyone ever again. Before the night was over, three people would be murdered. Somebody in there? Michael Myers is alive. Stop! You had a knife in your stomach. You and Allison should not have to keep running. Evil dies tonight. I'm not just going to sit and watch another innocent person die. If you track Michael's victim, that's a straight line to Michael's childhood home. What do we do? We fight. Let's hunt him down. Michael Myers is flesh and blood. But a man couldn't have survived that fire. The more he kills, the more he transcends. Run! Go home now! He's the essence of evil. Hi, I'm Scout Taylor Compton from Rob Zombie's Halloween, and you're listening to The Hysteria Continues. And indeed you are. Welcome back to The Hysteria Continues, episode 246, which doesn't sound very Halloween-like, but we are... After our last visit to Haddonfield, um, last episode, we're coming back for the sequel, the the mid-quill, whatever you want to call it, Halloween Kills. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see uh, what we all think of this. And I know some of our views were a little bit controversial last time. We make no apologies for speaking um, what, what we see, basically. But uh, I just hope everyone will understand that hopefully there'll be some differing opinions on this movie. But also, we're very excited... Uh, for two reasons. One of them is uh, Nathan is back. So Nathan, are you excited to be talking about Halloween Kills? I'm very excited to discuss this one. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, we, we've kind of kept it a little bit and our thoughts to ourselves, really, haven't we, on this one. So it's going to be interesting to see what we all think. Um, but we're also joined uh, by longtime friends of the show, uh, Joshua Gratton, uh, sort of director of Cuties. So uh, Joshua, uh, it's been 10 years in the making uh, having you on the show. So uh, thank you for coming on. How are you doing? Oh, thank you for having me. And uh, remember that evil dies tonight. <laughs> I've, I've heard that somewhere before. I think I've heard that somewhere before too. So um, uh, yeah, well, I'm looking forward to uh, getting your input on the show, Joshua. So uh, And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about um, uh, what you've been up to and everything a little bit later on. Um, but um, Eric, uh, are you excited to be heading back to Haddonfield? Well, as our resident Halloween buff, yes, I am. Oh, okay, right. And uh, Joseph, are you going to give me more than a one-word answer? No. No, okay. So uh, Joseph's going very, um, he's kind of uh, like French performance art, I think, for this episode. Or he's like um, trying to interview the Stone Roses. Yes. <laughs> actually, um, I'll just say um, I actually am kind of looking forward to talking about Halloween Kills. Okay, because I know we had some, um, it was interesting, the feedback, because I think it's fair to say without getting into the whole thing at the moment, that these films have been hugely divisive uh, amongst fun, fans of the franchise. And uh, I know we had some people saying that we they thought we were unfair with our criticism about the last film, which I don't think we were particularly, because we found uh, things we liked about it. But it's kind of, although we are a slasher podcast, we are going to pull things up. If there's things that don't work, we can't sugarcoat everything, so I just hope everyone can respect our opinions. But if not, you know where to to shoot us mis- uh, messages. I thought you were going to say something else there. No, Eric, mm. don't joke about that. Um, so, uh, but anyway, well, as as usual, let's have a little chat about what I've been watching recently. So, um, Joshua, have you seen anything you'd like to tell us about? Uh, yeah, I have, actually. Um, I'll stick with the horror stuff. Uh, I watched the remake of Slumber Party Massacre. You know, the, the series has always been comedic. But I feel like they just they went straight into parody. And I think that the first half works really well. There's a twist where uh, after the first body is found, they I don't want to spoil it, but like um, they take a swerve. And I thought it was like really original, but I think it bit off more than it could chew. It became like meta on top of its meta. And it ended up talking about uh, 
instead of like the Slumber Party Massacre series, like the first one and the second one, at least, they're very um, they're feminist by like showing um, what they're doing. And in this one, it, it just became all script. And I, I feel like it lost a little something along the way. Um, there are a couple good kills, uh, and I love the cast of the the women at first, but I think by the end I was just kind of I was just kind of over it. Okay, because I know it's one that I've been meaning to catch, uh, and I haven't had a chance to yet. I think it's been it's been a very busy week for me, but um, but I know I think uh, Nathan, did you catch this one? I did. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was. Um, a lot of fun. I, I definitely can see what uh, Josh was talking about um, because uh, it does, you know, get uh, pretty um, meta, I guess, for lack of a better word. But it it does have good kills and it's just it's a lot of fun. I mean, I thought that it was very entertaining from beginning to end. So, yeah, I really liked it. OK, uh, so I haven't seen it. But what about you, Eric? Did you catch up with it? I haven't caught it yet, though, but I know that Joseph has. Okay, well, what about you, Joseph? Yeah, I would probably agree with Joshua on this one. I think there's a point to where the characters almost act as if they are just standing inside of a movie set and they know it, and it becomes kind of grating. Um, Having said that, I did enjoy the first half, and I think the guy playing the Russ Thorne character does a really good job of just basically just kind of... just riffing on the um the original actor so uh yeah it's a marginal thumbs up i wouldn't go out of my way to see it again but i i had an okay time with it okay well uh hopefully i'll get a chance to watch it before we record the next show uh maybe eric will too but uh um okay well thanks joshua is there anything else uh yeah i watched the first two episodes of the uh the new chucky series Mm. um i didn't like cult of chucky very much so i i went in with very low expectations and there's a lot of there's a lot of tropes they go through because uh, the, the main character is gay. So they sort of they do that like uh, problem with his father thing and be, like ridiculed at school. But overall, I thought I thought it was pretty good, actually. Um, they mostly use I don't think it's CGI for for most of the scenes with Chucky. Um, he's he actually has a lot of funny one liners and there's this great character that. They, they made her so hateable. You're just waiting, like, I, I can't wait when they're going to kill her off or if she'll have, like, a redemption arc. Um, yeah, I was surprised. Um, I know it's Don Mancini's directing again and writing again, um, as he has been for the last three films. So, yeah, I'm super excited to see how it goes. I just hope it doesn't do what American Horror Story goes and, like, jump the shark too early. But, um, no, I, I was surprised. I thought Chucky was just a really good time. Um, has anyone else seen it? Not yet. It's it's on my radar. Um is Brad Dorif still doing the voice of Chucky? Uh, yes. Okay, and it's got Christina Lee, I know, in it, and um, the original Andy Barkley, I think, is is appearing. Are they may are they main characters, or are they kind of? I don't think Andy's in it yet, but we do okay. have uh, Lexa Doig from Jason X, and we yeah. had Devin Sa- Devin Sawa from uh, Final Destination. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Idle Hands. Hmm. I haven't seen. I haven't had a chance to see it yet. There's been so much on uh, at the moment uh, with Halloween coming up to Halloween. So, um, but what about you, Joseph? No, um, it is in my queue because uh, everyone on the forum is talking about how you know wonderful it is. So I will check it out. I'm not a big Chucky fan, but uh, yeah, I do want to see it. Okay, and Nathan? Yes, I watched the first two episodes and I really liked it a lot too. Um, I thought it was just a very interesting. Uh, you know, series. And I didn't know how they were going to do a series with Chucky in it, but so far it's been really good. So, yeah. Cool. Excellent. Well, another one to uh, look out for. So, uh, well, thank you, Joshua. Anything else? Uh, yeah, just one more. Um, I watched this uh, slasher from 1982. Um, it's from Taiwan and it's called Behind the Storm. It starts off sort of like a, a ghost story, you might think, like a, a, a man falls or is pushed from his, uh, his top floor and I think I think family members come back to his house to like sort out his will, maybe. Uh, and then someone starts bumping them off one by one. Um, as with a lot of those, uh, like the the East Asian um, horror films at the time that are slashers, they they definitely like liberally rip off some of the American ones. Like a body is thrown through the window uh, with a knife, and we know where that's from. Um, and there's like there's a few twists along the way. It's it's not great, but it is it is nice to know that there. are there are still are slashers to find um, once you've exhausted all the main ones that there are, you get to look in like nooks and crannies, but eventually you will find these little, uh, uh, I guess, quote treasures. 
Excellent. I, I haven't, to be honest, that that's not a title that I'm aware of. So um, I'm always on the lookout for the uh, uh, th- those kind of movies, like it, it Lives by Night, the, the, the Hong Kong one, and uh, I mean, there's a number of uh, uh, ones out there. So yeah, it's like you say, it's always a joy to know um, there's still titles to be discovered. Yes, and it should be noted that um, Joshua Gratton is the one who thrust uh, Early Frost upon us. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I liked Early Frost. I did too. Did you think, talking of Early Frost, Joshua, did you think we were fair to it? Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, I I didn't choose it because I thought it was a masterpiece or anything. Uh, quite the opposite. Um, I mean, I like the film, but I, I like it because it's such a, an anomaly. And I, I do consider it like a slasher, if just barely. But the, the reason I chose it for it is because I knew that whether you liked it or not, you would have a lot of questions at the end, and that would sort of uh, keep it going. I feel like I think Early Frost is... Uh, it's a film that you can rewatch based on the fact that it gives you no closure whatsoever. Not not so much that you you like what you're watching, but just the fact that you your your mind is always going like, okay, maybe it's this this time. Or so yeah, I enjoyed watching uh, or listening to you guys be completely confused by the ending. <laughs> well, thank you for um, for doing that because I say it's probably one that we probably would have taken a hundred years to get around to. So uh, sometimes when he's pushing the right direction or the wrong direction, but it still makes for interesting listening. Hopefully, so thank you for that. So um, and again, thank you for the for enlightening us about uh, a 1982 slash I'd never heard of before. So so uh, a good find. Um, well, thank you, Joshua. Is there anything anything else? Is that you? Uh, I think that's it for now. Okay. Well, if anything, if you think of anything else, you'll bring it be more than three to bring it up so uh and nathan how about you what have you been watching um the same things that josh has been watching <laughs> okay so nothing nothing new no not aside from those two and what we're going to discuss today okay well fair enough we're gonna i think we're gonna have plenty to say about halloween kills so we'll we'll get into that shortly but joseph how about you have you started watching you yet the third series <laughs> Yes, I finished that, and um, it didn't quite gel with me as much as the first two, but I still um, had a good time with it, regardless of its problems. Um, so there's that. Yeah, I also watched, there's another movie I watched, uh, a slasher film on Netflix. Uh, I think you guys watched, it's um, There's Someone Inside Your House, I think that's what it's called. Hmm. You know, it's so memorable, I can't even remember the title, so... Uh, Unless you guys have anything to say about that, I'll be, I'll be glad to move on. Did we, uh, Eric? Did we talk about that last time? I think we, we didn't. Tension. I don't think we did. No, but I watched it as well. And as as um, Joseph said, there's, it, it's so memorable. That I didn't really remember. I don't really remember much about it. Uh, I remember that uh, there's not a lot of stuff about somebody being in someone's house apart from the opening scene. And I thought, hmm, I feel cheated. The t- it's you know, trade descriptions. Well, the the uh, the whole basis of it, because it's based on a young adult book, was that the killer was killing people that were hypocrites. So there's one character who comes who paints themselves as very progressive, but also has kind of right wing leanings. Um, but then that's the only character that has anything that's hypocritical about them. So it doesn't make any sense. And without giving away, I won't give away the identity of the killer. But I just didn't get why the killer was killing people. And so I looked it up, and no one else did either. So they obviously were inspired by early frost. Joshua, I think is obvious. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's not a great. It's a shame because it has a lot of. I mean, it has a great. The, the one good idea in it is that the killer, quite unfeasibly, but it prints masks, uh, digital masks or digitally printed masks of the um, the victim to be. So when he or she stalks their victim. They're wearing a kind of not photorealistic, but kind of quite realistic mask of the person they're trying to kill, which is quite a creepy idea. Um, but it doesn't really work, I didn't think. Uh, Joshua, did you catch up with that at all? Uh, no, I have been sort of staying away from a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the newer stuff just because they feel very samey to me. Like I haven't even watched. I know what we did last summer because I, I don't know. I just after the. Uh, after the Fear Street films, I sort of started to notice they all kind of look the same and they all kind of groove the same. So I sort of have to wait a little bit before I watch each one come in. But um, that 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 film you were just talking about sounds a lot like sort of a twist on Terror Train, whereas the mm, mm. the mask isn't a previous victim; it's is now this victim. Or Happy Birthday to Me. Oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting. I mean, talking actually about, um, I know what you did last summer, the the Amazon series. I haven't watched it, but from what I've heard, it has absolutely nothing. It's not even a re- – I mean, there's no killer with a hook 
uh, Farmer Vincent on the on the forums, he is absolutely ripping it to shreds. So it's it's really interesting to read his thread on it because he doesn't like it, and he just he'll basically tell you everything that's wrong with it, and um, it sounds completely awful <laughs> poor poor show i don't i've got no problem with people taking a, a concept and gutting it and rebuilding it from inside and doing all kind of things but if you have a film you know a film about a killer of a hook although i know of course the the original book lois duncan hated what they did with the thing but you've got a property like that and then you're buying the rights to it and then you just kind of just basically re, to make another yet another sort of shitty teen drama with um some murders it just seems a bit pointless basically but um maybe one day after we've got through chucky and all the other thing all the other things then maybe we'll get around to uh one of us will brave it um so we'll see but uh joseph was there anything else uh yeah um i watched uh this is kind of a uh it's billed as a drama but it for me it feels like one of those um little little uh, demonic kids from hell films, even though it is a drama, it's called, we need to talk about Kevin. It's got Tilda Swinton. And, um, she basically, she's really disconnected from her son and she senses that something is really wrong with him. And her husband played by John C. Riley, he doesn't see it. No one else sees it. The boy just seems, uh, just like a normal kid, except for around her. He just seems like completely evil. And he is completely evil to the point that you're wondering how, um, no one else can see this. And, um, I mean, there's no, uh, you know, horrific set pieces. There's no, uh, uh, twists or gotcha moments. It really is just a drama, but I thought it was really, really well done. It's kind of, um, it has no plot narrative. It's just little segments of them kind of, uh, playing this chess match with, uh, one another. Um, she knows he's evil, but she's, you know, he's, he's her son. So she doesn't know what to do. And the kid is just, it's just this narcissist. You follow him from me, uh, from him being a child to being a teenager, uh, leading up to him doing something, which I won't spoil, but it's a really fascinating movie. And I can't believe I, um, I missed out on this because I know the critics talked about this one a lot. Any of you guys seen this one? A long time ago. Uh, cause it's, it's quite, I mean, what's about seven years old or so, is it? Yeah, it's like 2013-ish, I think, or maybe a little earlier. Mm. I think 2011. So, because it was based on the book, wasn't it? Which was kind of like the book du jour for a, for a while. Um, but yeah, I remember, I haven't seen it since it came out, but I remember liking it. And quite an unusual role for Tilda Swinton as well, who usually kind of plays slightly ethereal um, sort of characters. And so, it, yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was really good, but I, say I haven't seen it for a long time. And anyone else caught it? No. No? 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 Yeah. Okay. Well, fair enough. Um, <laughs> Joseph, anything Anything else? Yeah, just one more. Um, I watched VHS 94. Um, and if you've seen the previous VHS films, there's really nothing new here. Um, but it does have a couple of really good stories. One involves a, uh, a reporter who kind of goes into the sewers um, to basically discuss the homeless plight and why the homeless are sleeping in the sewers. And um, something interesting happens down there. And I really like that story. And another story um, features uh, these experiments being done on people in this like abandoned warehouse. Um, It's not quite as uh, good as that first story, but it's so over the top that you'll you'll certainly remember it. Um, But, you know, like the previous VHS films, it's got a shitty wraparound. The other two stories aren't that great. But, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, you know, at least they actually went back to a time where, uh, you know, they would be shooting on VHS because the previous three have all been digital. And uh, this actually looks like it's shot on an actual VHS tape. So kudos for, to them for that for once. But, uh, you know, if you've seen all the VH, if you've seen the previous VHS films, you're not going to see anything new here. But I would recommend it for at least those two stories alone. Anyone else seen this? Not yet. No. Nathan, Joshua, nobody. <laughs> well, it's uh, lots of suggestions anyway. And I know people have said they enjoy the, uh, the, the were recently seen because they get to... Uh, uh, they do get suggestions what to see and what not to see. So, um, well, it's like I finally have a lot to watch this time, and like no one's seen anything. It's like okay. <laughs> well, because it's a busy time of the year. Well, thank you, Joseph. Eric, how about you? Uh, in terms of horror, uh, there's only one sort of for me, and that is the latest from M Night Shyamalan, and that is Old, 
Um, now, this is greeted with mostly negative reviews, but that's not going to stop me watching one of his movies because I, I generally am quite forgiving of them. Uh, I'm the only sort of flag waver for The Happening, for instance. Um, there's not an anomaly with this one, though, is that some high brow reviewers were giving it high praise. Like The Guardian gave it five stars. Um, which I don't, I don't quite understand the praise going that far for it, but uh, I did enjoy the film. It's about a group of vacationers who go to this luxury resort, and they're encouraged by the owner of the resort to visit this secluded cove. And when they get there, they notice that they're starting to age rapidly, uh, and they work out that it's about one year in every 30 minutes. Um, so, and any attempt to escape uh, results in them kind of blacking out, and they w- wake up on the beach again. Um, the dialogue in it is very clunky, and I, I mean like really, really clunky. Uh, includes nuggets such as, um, I don't feel like I did yesterday. My thoughts have more colours in them now. I mean, what? Uh, and some of the acting is beyond dodgy. The, there's an actress called Vicky Creeps or Kreps. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. I think she, I looked her up on IMDb. I think she's from Luxembourg originally, but she plays the lead female role and, and she's quite bad in it I'm afraid to say I'm sure she's a good actress but in this she's very wooden and stilted uh, it kind of reminds me you know the way Mark Wahlberg who's a pretty solid actor is so awful in The Happening this is your cue Joseph to do your classic impression what no yep that's the one <laughs> um, so I mean I love but apart, apart from that I love the Twilight Zone premise um, and uh, I like the sort of the high concept nature of the plot, I suppose. Poor old Rufus Sewell is in this, and he has the thankless role of playing a doctor who has rapidly advancing dementia. So he has these outbursts where he starts babbling about Marlon Brando and Jack Nicholson for no apparent reason. Um, and it just comes across as being quite laughable. But um, overall, I'd say there's a there's a nice sort of strange, eerie quality to it in places. And it's got the most... Um, Absurd, well, absurd is probably not the right word, but it's got a very um, far out conclusion where things are kind of uh, over explained. But I think that's in a good way. For me, the, the downfall for the film is there's a lot of very cliched characters who end up arguing a lot on the beach. Uh, it kind of reminded me of the thing that sort of turned me off the mist, maybe, because in that there's, you know, one character is a religious fanatic one is you know is in a state of panic and they need to be calmed down and this is kind of the same here you know one is selfish and one is kind of a natural leader uh so they're all kind of cookie cutter uh characters but overall as i said the twilight zone nature of the plot really um uh impressed me and i was entertained from start to finish and i think a lot of the reviewers were saying they hate the way that the plot is over explained at the end but i i kind of liked it that it doesn't end in a cryptic nature. It sort of gives you all the facts laid out. Um, so anyone else seen Old? I've not seen it. Um, but I, I, I generally don't have a problem with um, Shyamalan films. I think they're, you know, if not for nothing, they're very entertaining. Mm-hmm. I think you'll like Old then, yeah. Right, well, thank you, Eric. Is there anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Okay, well, I'll just quickly rattle through a few things I saw. I've, I'm about two-thirds of the way through you the um the third season on netflix what do you think so far i like it but i agree it's kind of it's but i it's more of a parody isn't it it's more of a rather than it kind of seems like everything's they've kind of all the characters have been amped up so i like the idea that you've got these central characters who are bad people who are good people who are surrounded by awful people so um the you know the the people you relate to most the, the killers so I kind of like that idea. It's just everyone around them is so over the top dreadful and like social media influencers or kind of Cato Kings or whatever, just very over the top <laughs> stupid people um, that, uh, you know, and you want them, um, you want them all to die. Uh, so I'm enjoying it, but I think, yeah, it's kind of feels, um, and I like the way they've kind of rung a bit more out of the whole central premise, but uh, I, there's probably about 42 more books for them to make. So I'm quite enjoying it, but it's not, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not like a page turner um, in, in Netflix terms of as, as much as it was the first two seasons. But yeah, I, I continue watching it. Unlike um, with Slasher, when I said I watched, uh, I've kind of given up halfway through of the new season, which is a real surprise for me. I think I will go back to it, but I've, I just hasn't really, didn't really grasp me like the other seasons. So, and I take it you haven't started that, Joseph. 
No, um, I'm a little skeptical now. It's like everyone's kind of saying the same thing. So, mm, I don't know. It's just, it's hard to devote myself to that now. It just feels like it's kind of maybe run out of steam. Um, but, but anyway, I mean, let's see. So, the other two things I saw, which are completely kind of different to everything else, was um, uh, we had some friends around uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they wanted they, – they chose – uh, they one of them wanted to see the vampire happening from 1971, which is a bizarre German. I think it's German um, sex comedy with vampires, uh, directed by Freddie Francis, who did a lot of the Hammer uh, vampire movies. Um, so it reminded me a little bit of the um, um, what was his name? Um, oh God, uh, blah, 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 blah. Roman Polanski movie, Dance of the Vampires, um, with Sharon Tate. I think it's Dance of the Vampires, um, or, or the Fearless Vampire Killer. Sorry, and uh, so it's kind of similar to that, except in this one you've got a, a Hollywood actress going back to her Transylvania, uh, to her a castle where her her kind of um, uncle I think has died, so she's inherited it, and she's got a great. Um, uh, kind of her great aunt or great grandmother was uh, a very evil vampire. So, so basically, it's her. Um, she accidentally brings her her evil grandmother back to life, and um, throughout the movie, their their um, respective bras ping off, like Barbara Windsor on ketamine or on sort of cocaine or something. It's just kind of it's constant um, boobage all the way through, and uh, vampires. And it's got Ferdy Main, who, um, if you're like a slasher fan, which I'm sure you are, have listened to this, he was the he played the Dracula character in the horror star, aka Frightmare. Um, so, uh, so that was fun, but a bit silly. Uh, and talking of silly, we also watched um, rewatched Horror Hospital with Robin Asquith, um, uh, who plays a hapless musician who goes to a health spa where an e- evil Michael Goff is um, uh, experimenting on teenagers and turning into zombies. So it's a very typical, but a lot of fun, early 70s British horror, which I think I may have talked about before, so I won't talk about it massively. But I don't know. Horror Hospital and the Vampire Happening uh, as a double bill. Any any fans? I've seen Horror Hospital. I really like that one. I have not, I've not even heard of the other one. Neither have I. I've, I mean, I have Horror Hospital on Blu-ray. I do like it, but I've never heard of The Vampire Happening. I hadn't heard of it before either. It was kind of, it's just kind of a very bizarre... Um, sort of like Bavarian or German sex comedy. Well, it's not really sex because there's not much sex in it, but there's a lot of nudity and lots of people with... Um, they've got, it's got the silliest vampire teeth. Like, you know when people, when you were kids and you got straws and you cut them out to make them look like vampire teeth? No. <laughs> you never did that? No. Surely I can't be the only one who pretends to be a vampire with... Um... Yes, you're the only one. <laughs> yeah. Joshua, tell me I wasn't the only one. I'm sure you did that when you were a kid, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I well. all the time. Or I would use the... Uh... That little um, the things you get in Halloween, uh, the little fake cigarettes, and I'd use those exactly. <laughs> see, see, Joseph, who's the freak now? Was uh, Egg the Kurzweil's the war cry of your neighborhood, Justin? <laughs> well, I think um, well maybe uh, I think we should probably move on to the main attraction then, shouldn't we? And see whether Halloween Kills is really a trick or a treat. So um, we've got we have do we have the trailer, Joseph? We have something. I haven't thrown that together yet, but you'll hear something. (laughs) We have something. So after this, we'll come back in and we will discuss 2021's Halloween Kills. We're going to hunt him down and we're going to put an end to this. I want to take his mask off and see the life leave his eyes. Happy Halloween, Michael. Halloween Kills. Rated R. Under 17. Not admitted without parent. In theaters and streaming only on Peacock Friday. An injured Laurie Strode inspires a vigilante mob to hunt down unstoppable killer Michael Myers and end his reign of terror once and for all. Okay, that was from the Peacock streaming description, which is uh, not entirely accurate, but we'll get into that. Um, uh, Michael has survived the fiery trap set by the Strode family and immediately lays kind of gory waste to an entire squad of... uh, firefighters and uh as he's escaping the flames of the strode compound um meanwhile we get flashbacks to that um fateful night in 1978 so that halloween kills uh can kind of indulge in a little revisionist history to kind of prop up the narrative uh these flashbacks are actually done surprisingly well uh with a near perfect recreation of loomis uh using two actors uh you know one for the visuals and one for the voice although i hear uh some people have the issue with the voice. I can't really 
tell myself. But um, anyway, you also got the uh, Haddonfield's finest kind of canvassing the neighborhood, um, looking for the shape as after he's been shot. And there's still kids on the street, uh, you know, looking for Halloween candy. Uh, I think the flashbacks are really cold and gray, and they do a fairly concise job of staying, uh, you know, within that 1978 aesthetic. Um, the action in 2018 feels more like a fever dream as Michael makes his way through, uh, you know, victim after victim in this kind of high pitched, chaotic, like amalgam of murderous nonsense that defies logic and really leaves no room for error in showing, you know, that Michael Myers is just more than a man here. Um, it's this, uh, this first 30 minutes is like zero plot and all this artistic carnage that I actually found myself kind of invested as it asks and answers the question, you know, what if the boogeyman is let loose unchecked where we sleep after we've all succumbed to mass hysteria and panic? Um, I think, unfortunately, though, this is where the film kind of loses me as it attempts to slide back into a more conventional narrative of uh, Michael being hunted by this wayward mob of, uh, you know, fed up locals. And it's led by an a now um, and now adult uh, Tommy Doyle. And this time he's played by Anthony Michael Hall in uh, a truly unhinged performance. And you don't need to follow, you know, kind of the political stuff at all to see the parallels they're drawing with his character. The thing is, while I think the message is kind of clever foreshadowing of some, uh, you know, some current issues at large, I don't necessarily think it makes for a fun movie experience. And I certainly don't go to a slasher film or a Halloween film to kind of engage in more, uh, you know, political discourse, you know, regardless of whether or not I agree. Um, it also doesn't help that the movie is just it's so completely overwrought and didactic to the point of near, or I'd say it is insulting. You have, uh, you have characters constantly stopping mid scene to kind of remind us who Michael Myers is, you know, what he did and why, uh, you know, why law enforcement has failed and why quote unquote evil dies tonight. And you will hear that chant a hundred times in this film, if not 101. And it becomes more and more just heavy handed as it goes along until it kind of reaches this. Uh, I don't know. It, it, everything just turns sad as the wrong people kind of take the blame for Michael's actions and characters engage in like this senseless, uh, stupidly dangerous behavior. And the bloodshed, you know, moves from being kind of um, popcorny into this just just pure despair it doesn't really reach the screechy heights of a rob zombie film but it does kind of sidestep you know what makes these movies fun in favor of trying to shock and teach lessons on life at large and that sort of thing i it's not for me um one example and this is probably considered it well it is considered a spoiler so fair warning the mob uh the mob uh, rule has determined that one of the bus escapees from the previous uh uh, film is Michael Myers. So they chase him through the Haddonfield Memorial Hospital until he's kind of, you know, he's left with no choice but to make this suicidal leap from, um, from on top of the building. And, um, you know, just so we understand what we're seeing, you know, one or more of the characters, they, they kind of, they, they do that whole reflection on what they've done with, uh, the kind of dialogue. We're like, Oh my God, are we the monsters? And, you know, uh, it's just, it's like, we get it. Um, it just feels so cheap and wrongheaded because they, uh, they kind of negate their own message by showing the, uh, the suicidal aftermath of the guy on the, on the ground. He's like human paste and he's splattered all over the concrete and it just, it, it just feels cold and like uh, like off-putting you know having said that um you know halloween kills is nothing if not an ambitious film i don't think it works uh past a specific point but when it's firing on the right cylinders i think it really does fire uh, that first 30 minutes really felt like this kind of otherworldly almost alien take on the the Myers mythology. And I really enjoyed that. We've also, um, I mean, we've already dim, uh, demystified Michael Myers and I don't think any film will ever unring that bell. So I didn't necessarily have a problem with what they were uh, doing with this character. I think there's an interesting conceit in that we kind of lend the boogeyman his power collectively, but I don't know when it feels like the movie might explore that a little, it's cheapened by just another kind of, you know, startling gore effect. So it's kind of your half in half out, um, you know, elsewhere, Jamie Lee Curtis is giving really next to nothing to do. And the hospital scenes overall, I think they feel kind of perfunctory. 
Um, and she's not exactly the catalyst for this whole mob rule either. I mean, she's more or less just a, another excuse on a, a laundry list of uh, reasons why they're going after Michael Myers. I mean, she's kind of reduced to just, you know, a bullet point. Uh, the ending, uh, which sets up the third film, for me at least, I think it lacks kind of an emotional resonance. And that I, I, I wasn't invested in a certain character and really... That's more or less what I can say about the rest of the film. The I think you know a lot of it is, is ambitious. It has some really cool odd turns and it has it's really operatic violence. But all that stuff, you know, good in and of itself, uh, you know, it's it's not good enough because I look for you know relatability with the characters. And ultimately, I think this is just another Halloween film that lacks that. So um, I, I'm going to move on to our guest, but I will just end this by saying that while I can't quite recommend Halloween Kills, I am actually otherwise thrilled that I didn't outright hate the film. Um, there's a lot to like here, and I imagine if you take the film uh, into context within a finished trilogy, it may play even better. But on its own terms, I just think it kind of struggles against uh, some rather unfortunate forces. So uh, Joshua, sorry for that long ramble, but what did you think of Halloween Kills? Uh, I thought a lot of things of this, uh, this film, um, like you, I didn't, I didn't hate this. Uh, it, I, I saw it twice in theaters because of that opening. So even, even from, even from when Cameron finds the cop, I felt like, oh, this feels like, this feels big. Like we're going right to the action. And then, and then we, we go back to 1978 and I was seriously impressed with like the lighting and just like, it, it really took me back to, I guess, Halloween 2 at the beginning, but also uh, just the end of Halloween. Like, it really felt like like they knew what they were doing. Um, like, the first time you see Michael Myers walking down through the ha- townhouses with uh, with his, like, your white mask, just, like, sauntering through. I honestly, I'm not even joking, I was on the verge of tears <laughs> in the theater because I thought it was, they were, they just... I think it was like some of the best stuff they've done since probably like Halloween three and two, even, even with the the cop shooting um, that you sort of knew how it would come back. Um, I thought, yeah, I just, I was in love the entire time um, where this film loses me. Uh, so I'd say my favorite character in the film isn't even a strode. It's, it's Lindsay Wallace. And on the flip side, I would say Tommy Doyle is easy. My least favorite character. Um, not just cause he chants so much that evil dies. It's just, uh, I don't know. It just it, there's a tonal shift where you go from a slasher film to the mob rule, and then immediately after Tommy Doyle gets his bat and says we're gonna go out and hunt Michael Myers, we get to um, the couple at the gay couple at Michael Myers' uh, old home, and it just it just doesn't mesh. Like like you're going to a very dark place, and then all of a sudden you're pulling back and. I don't know. The characters feel very scripty. Um, I don't know. It just, I, I felt like there's so much good in this film and yet there's so much bad. It's sort of like Halloween kills is a magnifying glass and you place it over Halloween 2018. So all of the nice things about Halloween 2018 is much better, but all of the, all the bad things are like much worse and much more heavy handed. Um, I, I went with friends the first time, uh, about a week ago in theaters and we were saying how it's sort of like the French new wave of, uh, sorry, no, I meant, sorry, French new extreme of, uh, of Michael Myers. Um, no, it, it reminded us of high tension because you've got like that bandsaw, you've got the, uh, uh, it, it, you got the, um, the head through the stairs that I thought he was going to like decapitate. And then you got like the, the, the queer couple as well. It just, it felt like, like, I feel like Michael Myers is kind of ruined at this point. They say that they're going to go back and they're going to jump off from the original Halloween. But all I see is sort of a mixture between um, Michael Myers from Rob Zombie's films mixed with maybe like what they might do with a remake of Jason again. Um, I, I think they the sa- they sort of sailed the ship of... Uh of Michael Myers, um, as we knew him before that said, a lot of the kill scenes as graphic as they are, um, like there's a scene with, uh, the drone lady who gets the, uh, what is it? Um, the fluorescent light, uh, you can just like feel the pieces of the glass in her throat. And then Michael positions her to watch her husband get stabbed over and over. It just felt very like the fun was sort of, uh, drained out of, 
the film at that point. So you couldn't really in- enjoy the kills because it was trying to make a point with how like how how evil is Michael Myers at this point. Yeah, it, it is funny that they, they ignore Halloween 2, but they use a clip. Like, did anyone notice that? They use the mm-hmm. clip of Annie from Halloween 2. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was like, oh, okay, I guess, I mean, Universal, you can do that. Um, I, I don't know. It was, I, I enjoyed it because they got so much right. Like, the scene with in the car with Marion and the nurse and the doctor and Lindsay, uh, it was grim, but it, it felt like, like, it was silly enough to enjoy, but dark enough to be like freaked out. Like when Lindsay's walking, running through the forest, I was actually kind of scared. Like it was, it was menacing. Um, and I think they must have cut something out because I know that she, uh, they find her later, and her mouth is bleeding, and she's all dirty. So I, I don't know if they had a uh, something on the cutting room floor, but um, something was missing there. But I, I didn't really care. I, I thought it was just, you know, you had all that Halloween iconography. That made you feel like, even if even if the leaves are not orange, um, it feels like it feels like Halloween night and uh, proper continuation. Uh, as for the message, uh, like, yeah, like we were saying, like you can agree with the message, but still cringe at the execution. It's it's both on the nose, and and too sloppy to have like a proper, uh, like it's trying to. I think it's trying to say about like like fear and like fear mongering and fear makes people like unable to uh, to think about um, like what's going on and properly take measures with, with the mob and stuff. But with the mob, you, you have the, the mental institute guy stuck between the doors and all of a sudden you have like that music playing and you see uh, Karen Strode staring at the camera saying like, stop them or something. And it felt like they were really going for an Oscar. And I think they forgot that they're, they're, they're a schlocky slasher film, you know? Um, so that was again, another totally jarring thing, but I was okay with that until, like Joseph said, um, after the guy commits suicide and <laughs> Sheriff Crackett, um, bless the actor's soul because they really did him dirty. Um, yeah, he says, uh, um, we're all monsters. It was just like, I don't think this film thinks that highly of its audience, or maybe they, maybe in order to get greenlit, they had to. Uh, be more on the nose for the for the suits they were trying to progress to i don't know it was uh, like i said i don't hate this film but there's a lot of issues with it um the first time i watched this when i left the theater my friends were talking about it and the whole time i was just like i had nothing to say because i was so like this way and that um because it was such it was such a mixed bag for me uh i will say I wasn't going to go online and see what people were saying because I wanted to go into the podcast with a fresh mind. But um, reading online, people are like, like tearing each other apart over this film. <laughs> you have like in real life, like vitriol. Like you're not a true fan if you, if you, uh, if you hate this film, or you're not a true fan if you love this film. Uh, people just will not like accept. It's sort of like the mob rule, the mob mentality inside of Halloween. Like they're talking about Myers. And now in real life, everyone's like fighting over Myers too and not thinking straight. It was, uh, I, I think it's an interesting film to look at it from that point. Um, uh, I don't know. I I don't hate this film, but I would probably put it in the middle, maybe like above Curse, a little below four. Yeah, I, I don't know. This was a weird film, you guys. Sorry, I wish I could be more concise, but it, it honestly just makes my, my brain. Uh, I think it, once we get to Helling Ends, maybe everything will just... Halloween Kills will look better, um, but as it sounds, it seems like a bridge film that isn't able to elevate itself above being a bridge film. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that the film was called, the tagline, Evil Dies Tonight, which, of course, we hear ad nauseum throughout the film, when everyone knew it was the second film in the middle of a trilogy. So it, one of the, one of the a number of the kind of slightly um, uh, bizarre choices the film made, but uh, I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. But thank you, Joshua, that was... Um, really interesting so um nathan uh we don't know what you thought about the film so are you going to give your traditional uh sort of um tradition of positive uh view of this film or not i mean i'm intrigued what are your thoughts on halloween kills nathan i liked it with some reservations um i uh am you know it's got a great body count and uh like joshua was saying i really liked the character of lindsay wallace and i loved her scenes in the in the film 
I would be very interested to see what ended up on the cutting room floor, though, because I was thinking the same thing you are that, you know, there has to be something missing because mm-hmm. she didn't really get injured like that um, that we saw. So I'm imagining that something else was filmed there. Um, it was nice to see like a lot of, you know, the older characters return. I think they were a lot of, uh, you know, fun to watch. Uh, you know, Ty, Tommy definitely wasn't a lot of fun to watch, but, um, you know, I guess he served his purpose for the film. Uh, yeah, I, I think for me, it's when it gets to the whole like mob scene in the hospital that it just starts to drag for me. And and like I said, like you guys said, I, I know what they were doing and I understand it, but it just felt like those scenes dragged so long. And, you know, I was like, you know, I know where they're going with this. I just kind of wanted it to hurry up and, you know occur um i like the idea that a mob is trying to kill michael myers but you know as we all know that's just not going to work and you know they found that out too i do love that the woman who brought the iron is getting so much internet attention (laughs) i wonder (laughs) she's going to um she's going to exploit that because uh she should do shouldn't she yeah i'd exploit it if i could (laughs) but yeah um I, I didn't like that, you know, Lori was, I mean, I'm sure she'll be given a lot to do in the finale, but in this one, you know, she doesn't really have much to do. Um, you know, she, uh, for more or less, is just sort of a background character in this one. Um, but I mean, it's always nice to see Jamie Lee Curtis again. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to, um, I don't know, cat- categorize this movie for me. Like, I. I definitely think there's more good than bad, but I do think that, you know, it's, it's definitely got some issues. Um, but I mean, I'm also like a, in the, in that camp of, uh, maybe it'll be a better upon watching Halloween ends, like watching it as a trilogy. Maybe that will make it, um, even maybe that'll make it better. Hmm. It's going to, I mean, we'll talk about the rumors about what Halloween ends is going to be or what's been announced so far, uh, probably a little bit later, but, uh, Nathan, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say? I mean, obviously we can chip in as we go in, cause I'm sure there'll be a few more talking points as we get going. Yeah. Now, those are my general thoughts. Hmm. Definitely. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Eric. Well, I'm probably going to be the, the, the positive voice here. I mean, I didn't, there are lots of things I didn't quite like about Halloween Kills, but overall I was really entertained by it. Uh, like Joshua, I was completely floored by how brilliant the flashback scenes were to 1978. Uh, like when that first, I, I didn't, I hadn't read that much about Halloween Kills before I watched it, and I didn't realize there were flashbacks to 1978. So first of all, when they appeared, I was surprised. Secondly, I thought they looked incredible. The Myers house looked exactly like it did in the 1978 film. The lighting, the the wardrobe, everything was perfectly matched. And Michael Myers looked exactly like he did in 78. The mannerisms, the boiler suit, the mask, they've you know, after so many sequels with dodgy masks, this one managed to replicate it down to a T, I thought. Uh, so it felt to me like I was watching a deleted scene from 1978. And I wouldn't say I cried when I was watching it like Joshua did, but I was close. I was close. I was like, it, it felt, you know, you know the way like when we saw, finally saw maybe those deleted scenes from Friday the 13th Part 2. That's what it felt like. It felt like I was seeing, finally seeing an outtake from this film from that nobody has seen in 40 years. That's how authentic I found that they felt. So, you know, I'm giving them real kudos for that scene. Um, I love the opening credits again. I love... Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of the opening credit sequences of some of the Halloween films, particularly one and two. Uh, and, I, and I thought the 2018 one did it good as well with the rotting pumpkin coming back to life using reverse photography. And this one, we have sort of a flaming, several flaming pumpkins, I thought was very well done as well. So, I mean, for the first 15, 10, 15 minutes, I was really with it. I thought this is great. And um, I also like the fact that it picks up exactly where Halloween 2018 left off. I love sequels that do that, and there's no time elapsed between the two films. Um, so again, but what, like once the credits are over, like everyone else is saying, there's good things and bad things. First of all, the good. I mean, I enjoyed the returning characters, except for maybe Tommy Doyle, as you're all mentioning. 
Um, I don't think he's a particularly unlikable character, but he's not a particularly likable character either. And he seems to be kind of front and center for large chunks of the film. It was fun to see um, original actors returning to the roles, particularly Kyle Richards. Um, and then we had Nancy Stevens and Charles Cyphers as well back. Um, but like, I suppose I should say spoiler alert here. Uh, like Joshua was saying, Kyle Richards for me was one of the real attractions for the film. It was great to see her back. I don't know if she has been acting for the last 30, 40 years, whatever, since she was a kid. Um, but I thought she was really good in this. Again, a really likable character. The most suspenseful scene, I think, involves her where she's chased into the woods and she's hiding at the base of a tree from the shape and the shape is sort of nearby. And I thought that was done really well and I thought it was really suspenseful. Um, what I wasn't that pushed on was how disposable a lot of the returning characters turned out to be. Uh, some of them are only on screen for like five minutes and they're they're killed off, um, which is a shame because I liked seeing those characters return. They, they, they're set up initially to look like they're going to have lots to do with the plot and then they don't. Um, I did like the warmth um, that the character of Laurie has in the first half of the film when she's unaware that Michael Myers has survived the Inferno from the first film. She shares some nice moments with Will Patton's character in the hospital um, ward and I thought that was, you know, it brought a warmth to her character that was missing from the first, from the 2018 film. Uh, so I enjoyed that as well. And I mean, if, if you're a gore hound with Halloween kills, it certainly delivers, you know, the knives in eyes and fluorescent light bulbs and necks and heads twisted 360 degrees. And I'm a gore fiend as much as anyone. And, and probably if Halloween kills had come out maybe 30 years ago, I would have lapped it up a lot more than I did as a 47 year old. Um, it just felt like, as we were saying with Halloween 2018, it felt a bit vicious the and um mean spirited the, the the gore um you know one of the, the you know the fun has been sapped out of the film and i don't quite like this new iteration of the shape where he is almost like an action hero there's a scene at the start where he he you know offs loads and loads of um firemen and then later on in the film he sort of does the same he's it's like a street fighter video game where he turns into Jean-Claude Van Damme and there's this melee and he has, uh, you know, he just, they keep coming at him one, one, one at a time and he just keeps killing them all. Round which, one, fight! Th this is it. it. It just, it feels sort of against the Halloween formula that I know and love from the first two films in particular. You know, I, I keep, I don't sound like a broken record, but I just like when a slasher film the slasher is killing people one by one and they're kind of blissfully unaware that there's trouble, you know, nearby until the end of the film. Whereas in this one, you know, the mob thing, again, you know, not for me, the hospital scenes, I can see why everyone's saying they're kind of superfluous. They didn't really need to be there. Uh, but the thing that probably stood out the most was the gay couple who are now living in the Myers house. As Joshua was saying, they, they seem to have parachuted in from a different film. They're kind of played for comedic effect. They kind of reminded me of the comedy cops from Halloween 5. Where, But, you know, in retrospect, those comedy cops kind of fit in more neatly into Halloween 5. In this one, the film is trying to be a bit more worthy. And, and then having these two characters who, I mean... <laughs> It's 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 like quirky comedy. They're like from a Wes Anderson film or something, and uh, neither of them were particularly likable. Uh, and yeah, so they 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 kind of stood out. And as the other thing I think we've all said is the constant mob chanting of "Evil dies tonight," which is cringy. I'll say that. But for me, the good outweighed the bad. Uh, and particularly for those nineteen seventy eight scenes alone, I I really enjoy the film and. I had read the negative advance reviews before I saw the film, so uh, my expectations were lowered considerably, and it easily surpassed uh, my expectations. And I'm looking forward to seeing Halloween ends. Mm. And Eric, I was going to ask, isn't there a video out there of you boffing 20 firemen? Oh, you'll have to pay good money for that. You might find it in one of your Spanish supermarkets, Justin. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Is there anything else to say? Um, except spoiler alert one character gets killed at the end of Halloween ends that um, I wasn't impressed with because I kind of liked them I know that Joseph doesn't but I did and uh, yeah 
I hate that character. I was so happy when that happened. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. No. She was insufferable, like even more so than, yeah, I won't say anything. I, I was, I mean, it, it was, it was cruel and it was like the film's already very mean. And they're just sort of over like tipping it over. But part of me was like, yes, like no, no more of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joshua, I would be disgusted with your opinion, except that I know for a fact that you love Toya. So I'll let you away with it. I have her anthem album right beside. <gasps> That's a great album. Yeah. Even Justin likes that one. I, I love Popstar. It. It's my favorite song on the album. Excellent. What's, what were you saying, Justin? Something negative, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I was just going to give my little take on Halloween Kills, uh, just so we complete the, the ring, as it were. But um, the uh, I kind of, it's funny, when I saw it first, I was kind of not blown away by it, but I really, I was really enjoying it. And um, I've seen it twice now. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm curious, have you seen it twice, Eric, or have you just seen it once? I have. No, I watched it twice because uh, I was saying to you, um, with Halloween 2018, I was really impressed with my first viewing, but then loads of flaws became evident to me on my second viewing. So I wanted to make sure of my opinion on, on Halloween Kills, and it didn't really change from, with the second viewing. Okay, okay, it was interesting. I mean, for me, it was not the opposite, but I, I found when I first watched Halloween Kills, I thought I was really digging it. I thought, oh, this is really good fun. Um, and then as it got through, and all the things you said, I agree with. I mean, the the, the hospital scenes, I think the idea of having a vigilante vigilante justice thing is, is, is solid. You know, I think it's a, a good idea. Um, and I appreciate wait, appreciate that basically this is like the Hollywood uh, sort of biblical epic of Halloween movies with like a cast of not quite thousands, but um, it feels very big, uh, and I like that. But I couldn't really done it for me. There was a few, there were a number of things, a lot of things I really enjoyed in the movie, um, and there was one major, major, major flaw which I just can't get over, which I will get to in a minute. But the, the 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 scenes in the hospital, it felt like almost like this was a video game. Um, and Michael Myers was was uh, powering up. He was almost like Sonic the Hedgehog, that he was, or uh, Super Mario Brothers, or something. He was, every kill he was powering up, which is what Laurie Strode says. He's kind of like with every kill he becomes more evil. And it seems to be very strange that I don't I've, the, the, this franchise so far. The, these these so the two films we found seem to be quite unfocused. It feels like what are they actually going for? Because. Um, the director said he wanted to make a Halloween film where he took back to the magic and the horror of the quiet horror of the original Halloween film and not Michael Myers as some unstoppable monster killing machine, which is exactly what he makes him in this movie. And he's, he is like, I was kind of saying, like he's like the Handfield Voorhees. It almost reminds me of like um, Rawhead Rex in the William Shatner mask. You know, he's just kind of, he's just on, bang, bang, bang. He's just kind of, Whereas the original Halloween, it was he was a shape, he was in and out of the shadows, he was like a spider, you know, in the dark watching. Um, and here it's kind of he's all business, and it's just like bam, 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 work my way through. He is. It feels to me like Sonic the Hedgehog spinning through, picking up um, stars and uh, whatever sort of, um, and all the the numbers, all the scores flying out as he's killing his victims. Now I don't hate that idea. I don't hate the idea that he's powering up into this kind of super evil villain and one of the talking points i want to get to is about whether or not the michael myers now has literally transcended and is now becoming this unstoppable boogeyman but the thing that really killed it for me and the thing i just can't get over and i don't understand why is what they did to laurie strode i think it's just absolutely unforgivable what they do with a character because essentially she has nothing to do with this at all there's nothing her family and her are superfluous there's no point of them being in the movie at all you know, she's going saying to anyone who will listen, Michael's coming after me tonight. He's coming to the hospital. Michael Myers doesn't give a fuck about Laurie Strode or her family. He just wants to get to his sister's house and look out a window one last time, which <laughs> it seems crazy to me. What, what on earth were they thinking? It's like having an alien movie with Sigourney Weaver um, and then getting a set, set in a med bay while the alien rampages around the, 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 the thing and she just buffs her nails. I just don't understand it. I don't understand why Laurie, um, Jamie Lee Curtis signed on for this version of Laurie wow. Strode. This is the most animated I've ever heard, Justin, mm. ever. And Joshua, I must apologize for his potty mouth. <laughs> but I, I don't, I really, I just kind of can't get my head around it. I can understand why they got rid of the sister angle from Halloween 2. I can understand that. And the whole thing that made Halloween the original so scary for me 
was that it was the, uh, the fact that he just kind of went after Laurie Strode like a like it, like a shark that smelt blood in the water. And it could have been any one of us. If any one of us had walked past at that time, he would have latched onto us. And that was what was scary about it. Um, and then when Halloween 2, they made the sister angle, which made it more functional. Um, uh, you know, it was wrong-headed, but it worked, I thought, in a kind of cheap jack way. But with this, is uh, Michael Myers had nothing... You know, the only reason he ended up having the confrontation with Laurie Strode in her house was that the evil Dr. Sartain um, made it happen. If he hadn't have done that, Michael Myers would have gone nowhere near Laurie Strode. So she basically, the, the whole point of this movie, it seems, is this woman has wasted 40 years of her life planning for the day that Michael Myers comes out after her and her family, and he just doesn't care. And so what exactly are they going? And I can't really see how they can patch this up with Halloween Ends, because Michael Myers is ghosting Laurie Strode. Uh, you know, what? what is the point? I mean, is it for me? Is it just me? I just don't understand. You know, you take any. It's like having Ash in the Evil Dead just going and sitting in a in a Wendy's while people are being chased around the woods. You know, I don't understand it. I, it doesn't compute with me, and it feels um, it sold her character short, as far as I'm concerned. Because I, I would have preferred if Michael Myers had gone, was coming back and going after her and her family. But all this thing where they sold it like three strode strong and all this kind of stuff. It, the Strode family has nothing to do with this at all. It's kind of, I, it doesn't compute for me. Well, this is the problem of it being uh, the centre of part of a, of a trilogy that they know in advance is going to be a trilogy. So they don't need a um, conclusion. They don't need to advance the story as much as they would if it was just a standalone sequel. But do you think it would be, is it going to even work? Why would he then decide he wants to go after Laurie Strode and her family in the third part if he's got no interest in them whatsoever? Maybe he does have interest. He just didn't know she was in the hospital or he doesn't. He has no sense of direction. I, I don't know. I don't know. I find it I find it difficult to, for, for me, that is the problem. It's kind of like, I think if they made, brought Sigourney Weaver back for an alien trilogy and basically gave her nothing to do, or Ash and the Evil Dead, or, you know, if you think of any um, heroine or hero of a horror movie and then just kind of basically wrote them out of it and made them superfluous to the action, it, it doesn't, I find it really difficult to get past that with this movie. Um and I mean, so having said that, I, there's lots of things I liked in the movie. I say I didn't mind the idea of Michael Myers leveling up to this kind of monster that was superhuman monster, because I've always subscribed to the idea that Michael Myers isn't really a man. He's more superhuman than uh, or full of supernature than necessarily just a psycho who's come back after 20 and then 40 years. Um, so I don't have a problem with that. And I, th- the picture looked great. It kind of, it was, and I, I in some ways appreciated the gonzo filmmaking, you know, having this idea that it got, it's like a Looney Tunes version of Haddonfield. We've got doctors, ER doctors abandoning their posts and joining in a vigilante mob running around Haddonfield Hospital is crazy, you know, and it's... I, I, I also like this, the, the, the how the, uh, when he's killing the firefighters, they all just kind of line up in a queue waiting to be killed. It's like they don't attack him all at once. It's like one by one. And also, what is Laurie? You know, she's in hospital with the, the um, which is the um, Officer Hawkins. And he's talking about the guilt he has about not um, stopping uh, Loomis killing Michael Myers. And I'm thinking nothing compared to the guilt Laurie Strode's going to feel to her kind of 40 years in the making um, sort of Michael Myers oven that she built in a basement had a fireproof <laughs> closet. I yes, that was a bit <laughs> eye rolling. That was like that was like undoing the decapitation at the end of Halloween H two O. It was kind of like I mean that was the most ridiculous thing that they've kind of it's almost they wrote the first film and then thought well we burnt him to crisp and what do we do? And to have this closet where he can just hide away from the flame and get lightly singed. It's it's kind of I thought surely you could have come up with a better solution than that really. So Laurie Strode actually is the linchpin in so much that she didn't stop Michael Myers because she didn't do her her you know didn't do go to the right place in Home Home Depot. You know she she should have done better basically. So I kind of and also the 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 thing that annoyed me about these movies especially I think also is that um, I loved, you know, uh, the Lindsay Wallace, Wallace character, and I think she was really good. I didn't like the way they brought back um, Nancy Stevens' character. I thought that was really mean-spirited that, you know, she goes to shoot a gun at him and goes, this is for Dr. Loomis, and then she stabbed to death. It just felt like she was given more to do in H2O uh, when Jamie Lee Curtis was given more to do in in, um, in Halloween 2 than this movie. 
But with the Lindsay Wallace um, uh, chase scene through the woods, I mean, apart from the fact that she decides rather than running towards the, all the houses with people in, she runs towards an isolated ornamental fish pond in the middle of some woods. But the fact is all of that was actually really good suspense. And then you get to a point and then it cuts back to some hospital scenes. So why, you know, Halloween 1 and 2 was, were more about suspense than they were about gore. And I would have personally liked to have seen these films taking it back like they promised it was. Like John Carpenter was saying, they get it. They get Halloween. I mean, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to come across too mean spirited. But does John Carpenter just need a new Paul or his his roof redone, or Jamie Lee <laughs> Curtis? I mean, why have they given their blessing to these movies when really I don't think they get Halloween at all? Uh, Rob Zombie didn't get Halloween at all. But I really don't think they do, and I, I it's, it's a it's a shame for me because there are bits in this I liked, um, but for all the stuff about we get Halloween, we're taking it back to this creepy to the the night he came home, all this kind of thing, and they haven't at all. And I I I think it's a missed opportunity, you know. And I, I it's because I love these movies, I love Halloween, and I love Halloween too. Uh, the originals, and I l- really enjoy some of the sequels. I hated the Rob Zombie movies, and I, they, these are much better than those. They're much more enjoyable, but I just think they fluffed it. You know, they had a chance, they had the last chance probably Jamie Lee Curtis to bring back, and I didn't want carbon copies of the first Halloween movies, but I, they've, they, you know, they've just fluffed it as far as I'm concerned. I would have I would have personally loved carbon copies of the first two Halloween movies. I just don't understand why Michael Myers has gone from being this kind of like this, you know, the flashback of doing it so well, and then they have turned him into the Haddonfield Voorhees. Or they it's almost like some money man somewhere has said, you know, the kids love the Rob Zombie movies, gonna make it really violent. I think if the flashback is anything uh to go off is that they can make a return to form. It's just that they probably they just don't want to but mm. it's totally possible now. Yeah, my understanding is that I think they do have a good, you know, visual eye on what makes Halloween work, but they kind of get bogged down in over, you know, overextending the plot when there's no need to because Halloween has no plot. And I think they're just trying to add on like this whole thing with the mob. It just feels too plot heavy for a Halloween film. Well, it's kind of like, I mean, I like the, you know, the, uh, the juxtaposition between the uh, Haddonfield Memorial Hospital and Halloween 2 from 1981, which was ridiculously un, you know, there was nobody there. And that was, I, I liked it for the creepiness angle. But the Haddonfield Memorial Hospital feels like, um, um, I don't know, like a Mori Povich show or something. A Jerry Springer audience in Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, it's kind of so over the top. Uh, it's, I mm. don't, it's like a Looney Tunes cartoon to me. And again, I love it and I hate it, and I don't. It's, um, but having said that, it's it's elicited a strong response from me. So it certainly, yes. The one thing I forgot to mention was that uh, the other thing that got a strong response from me was the killing of Cameron, where his uh, head is bashed around the um, the stair. What's it? Stair? The banister? Whatever you want to call it, which. I thought looked really st- it I mean it was nasty but it also looked really stupid and really silly and it, it was reminding me of that scene in Freddy's Dead where the killer is or the victim is trapped inside the video game and he's bouncing up and down the stairs that's kind of what it it sort of reminded me of and uh yeah so I think that they do go overboard with the <laughs> with the kills a bit did you, did you like the bit where Allison uh walks past the open front door down the hallway as Michael Myers is coming down the stairs I mean, again, things like, you know, she's just seen her boyfriend being brutally murdered and rather than running out the front door, she decides to walk down the hallway. You know, it's kind of just things like that is kind of like, mm. I, I mean, it's I, in some ways, I actually really, I think I like the, the gay couple, Big John and Little John. In the movie, it felt to me like it was actually going back to more of an 80s style sort of slightly silliness, which I enjoyed. Yeah, they would they would fit in quite nicely in Halloween Five. Exactly, and that's for me. I didn't mind that. Um, that was, and actually, I thought that Michael Myers, in some ways, wasn't as that we we criticised the mean spiritedness in the first film with him dropping the teeth over the the, the into the um, into the bathroom stall, and he had a bit more playfulness, I kind of guess, in with this, but this ab- hyper brutality, and so I kind of guess the question is is that without spoiling. Well, hopefully you've seen the end of the movie by now and you've seen the movie. But it seems to me that, you know, there's no way that they can say that Michael Myers is anything but supernatural now. Unless the last 10 minutes are a dream. Well, they could be like and Bobby Ewing comes out of the shower. Yeah. 
Yeah. Laurie Strode comes out. Ben Tramer comes out of the shower. I mean, the question, there's a couple of questions here. One is that obviously because of the pandemic, Halloween Ends was meant to be filmed back to back with uh, with Halloween Kills, which to my mind, I don't know what the plot was going to be. But um, the from what I've read is that they're doing this four years, Halloween's Ends going to be four years after. And they've just got the script approval by John Carpenter on the concept or maybe even the script. So do does anyone know whether or not Halloween Ends was meant to be a continuation of this same night? I hadn't read anything, but I'm assuming it was, yeah, that I, I thought the three would tie together like Friday the 13th, 2, 3, and 4. Because is from what I've read, Jamie Lee Curtis has said um, a lot of people are going to be really pissed off with Halloween Ends. Yeah. Yeah, I think I know what she means by that, though. I mean, it's it's part of your background, isn't it? What she means by that. Well, to do with the it being a sort of a parable about COVID. Yes. Yes, but I'm not mm. quite sure where they can go with that, apart from Michael Myers has always worn a mask. Mm. yeah well maybe it's um maybe it's like you know michael myers has killed you know 600 people in one night maybe you have people who believe that he's killed people and people who adamantly deny that he's killed anyone uh well that could be interesting but um it's where you go with this the end of this movie where he has this kind of fight scene and then literally is this like it is like a video game he's it's like um uh, mortal kombat isn't it really on halloween Mm. night and I'm not quite sure where the police are for all of this going on. It seems a bit strange. But anyway, it's kind of, it, it ramps up to this kind of crescendo of violence. And then we're, we expect to go, oh, four years' time. It's kind of what, what you know, I in some ways, I would have rather have seen Michael Myers pinging around like a pinball machine around Haddonfield some more, just hyping up and up towards Haddonfield Memorial Hospital and get that confrontation with Laurie Strode. But I, I don't know. I'm not sure what they're going to do. But I, I was just curious about whether or not the original concept would have been to continue the uh, the you know the trilogy would have ended on that night. Um, but um, but uh, Nathan, I'm curious. Do you think Michael Myers uh, now has become more than become the boogeyman? Yeah, I was like, he has to be um, like uh, superhuman at this point. It has, you know. I mean, they keep on saying. I mean, the dialogue in this is so kind of over the top and so. Th- you know, it's, I've seen people say that it feels like it's a first draft that wasn't polished um, because mm. and I sort of thought if you had a drinking game and we could have done our drunk cast by every time someone says, you know, evil dice tonight or, you know, Michael Myers has come back home and we're going to kill him or whatever. You would be drunk and under the table It'd be like a suicide cast. Mm. And it's kind of like it's this weird theatrical approach to it. It just kind of it's, you know, it's almost like. I know his character is almost like it's, it's almost trying to be Shakespearean, but I don't. It's it's odd. It's odd. It feels to me like a. I think was it you, Nathan? Uh, sorry, um, Eric has said it felt like a fever dream, or maybe you, Josh. It's it's cra- It's it's odd. I I don't I don't quite get it. And if, I kind of guess the other thing for me, and I will shut up in a second, is that the reason why for me Halloween and Halloween Two works so well, and a lot of slasher movies, is that you do have this kind of. Um, a uh, core group of characters that are circled by this kind of evil, the slasher, rather than this kind of this biblical epic of everyone running around with their hands in the air, screaming with pitchforks. It's kind mm. of that for me. It makes it less scary. It makes it more of a like a Looney Tunes cartoon rather than a, a slasher movie, let alone a Halloween slasher movie. Um, and in some ways, I would have rather, I mean, for my money, I would have rather have seen a core group of characters, um, including the um, uh, Lindsay Wallace character, who literally, they take to the hospital and put her in a wheelchair and she's off. We never see her again. You know, she's gone. So, um, you know, there's characters. I would have actually liked to have seen those, you know, those core characters actually given their own spin-off movie to develop them a little bit more. Um, it's just too much going on. I think there's just too, there's so much going on in this movie. I think it was just too much. Um, it kind of you you it was like like literally a pinball machine where your eyes were going around the, the film trying to work out where it's going next and it didn't give enough time for me for the film to breathe to allow mm. any suspense to generate it just didn't it was too too kind of let's throw everything in um and um so anyway i'm gonna shut up now sorry no, I do agree. It it feels quite unstructured. And I, I put that down to the fact that it was kind of the middle part of a trilogy, a planned trilogy, so that they didn't need to have a solid three act structure to the film. But yeah, it is there's a there is a lot going on. 
Yeah, I mean, what's I mean, what are our thoughts on? I mean, we're going to spoil it because we we do, and we. Talk, I mean, again, if you if you listen to this and you haven't watched it, then really you should go and watch it first, please, because I, I think it's probably worth talking about the ending of the movie. Um, and the killing of Judy Greer's character, which was uh, I read mm. was meant to be structured around or reminiscent of the, the shower scene in Psycho, which is obviously the, the links between uh, Jamie Lee's character, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's character, and um, and uh, her mother, her mother in in Psycho. But it was kind of for me, for me, the, her character. I I I didn't like in the I've said in the first film, I didn't like the fact that she went from I, my mother's crazy to um, her end going gotcha. You know, it didn't it didn't scan for me at all her character arc and in this she's kind of like i don't know i she didn't really i didn't quite get her character really you know um uh it's did anyone else did who i mean i know joseph you didn't really like her character did you well she's i think she's kind of grating but you know like laurie strode she also has really no reason to be there so i mean really what's the point and i think what what they're trying to do is they're trying to lure um, Michael and uh, Laurie back to one another with the killing of Judy Greer. And, you know, I applaud them for that. But, you know, why spend a whole movie following them if they have nothing to do with, you know, Michael's rampage? Um, I just I felt no emotional resonance with her, with any of the Strode women. And I, God, I hate, I hate that tagline, three generations Strode strong. It's just so cringy. Ugh, ugh, it makes my skin crawl just, just thinking of it. And seriously, I hate it that much. Ugh. I'd also, I, I don't really, I don't really warm to um, Andy Matichak as Allison. I don't know why. Well, I'm sure we've lost a few vis- uh, listeners with our my outburst so no apologies i think we've lost them all <laughs> <laughs> well i think it's i you know i i much prefer this to the rob zombie movies you know and i would watch this ad nauseum you know for over and over before i'd ever watch those again unless i was very very drunk which uh, is a possibility but i i am interested i'm intrigued to see where they're going with halloween ends because um, we talked about this kind of the whole thing, the COVID thing, which I think could be interesting. Whether or not they, I think what you said, Joseph, I think it was that you said about it might be interesting if you do have Michael Myers deniers. That even rhymes, doesn't it? I honestly think that's probably where they're going with this. I mean, it's kind of, it feels like it's almost written on the wall. It could be interesting, but again, how. I think they said they're going to do something about the uh, the pandemic in the mm. Halloween ends. So brace mm. yourselves. Yeah, I suppose it's kind of like everyone's going to, well, not everyone, but most people will be in masks, won't they? So, but well, let's go, let's wait and see. I mean, I, I hope, I genuinely hope the whole thing's brought together in a cohesive kind of story mm. arc from the first one to Halloween Kills to Halloween Ends. But I don't hold a massive amount of hope considering how chaotic everything is has been especially in halloween kills um but i will be watching it as you know i'll be first in queue to watch it again so you know um and i'm sure we'll be hopefully we'll still all be around to uh to talk about it this time next year so do we i mean do we want to get into any background anybody have any background stuff i mean there's i mean i can i guess it's a new movie i mean do we have any any um, nathan what about you have you got any background no <gasps> We've missed that, you see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't really have anything either. The only one thing I had was um, listener uh, Jenny Hall Cameron. Uh, she was an extra on set, and she says it was shot under the title Mob Rules. So there you go. Um, you know, it's a Halloween film. I typically don't look for background on these films because someone will release this on a, a documentary disc in, in a year's time, and they'll have all the cast members on there. So. Mm. So, I mean, the other thing, of course, was, did we mention about the Dr. Loomis character, didn't we, about how that everyone thought he it was CGI. Uh, it was actually, I read somewhere that they had filmed or they were going to film a sequence that was going to go back to 1978 in Halloween, the 2018 movie, and they were going to use him as Loomis in that. But I, I don't sometimes, I mean, there's, especially when new films come out, there's so much kind of trivia and stuff tr- flying around on it, and a lot of it is maybe isn't the the most uh uh well i think i think the uh the stuff we see in halloween kills is the stuff they filmed for 2018 but they just didn't use it and they just recycled it so is that the case well it it could well be that could well be the case so um uh yeah well there's any other any other thoughts before we get to i mean we can talk i mean obviously um 
this isn't the biggest disappointment of the episode because obviously we've got Eric's joke of the week to come. Hey. So, um, but I mean, what did uh, what was the consensus? Would you was this a divisive movie on the Facebook group, Joseph? Yeah, we had ninety two comments across our socials, and um, let's see, Alexander Bokenkamp he writes. Uh, at times, it didn't feel like a Halloween movie, and there were too many characters, but still, it was just an awesome slasher movie. Myers was terrifying, and the movie had a lot of guts, literally and especially, especially figuratively. The movie didn't play it safe at all. Uh, let's see, that was from Alexander Bogenkamp. Uh, Ingo Dirk Schneider writes, uh, it, felt, it left me feeling completely cold. The worst thing you can say about a film... I didn't care a bit about the characters and the non-existent storyline, and I'm really glad that it will hopefully end with the next installment because it's just not worth spending any more time and money on this series. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter if you enjoy the show and want to help support it. Consider joining us on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash the hysteria continues. If you want to sign us up for a bunch of spam mailing lists, our email address is the hysteria continues at gmail.com. Excellent. And uh, I mean, one one thing I will mention is obviously the film has done pretty good box office so far, isn't it? I mean, traditionally, slasher movies and franchise movies tend to do great box office for the first weekend and then uh, sort of slip off quite quickly. But um, this was released to Peacock Streaming and to theatres on the same day, or I presume the same day. Uh, and during a pandemic. And during a pandemic, mm. and made $50 million in its opening weekend, which um, I was above expectations. So there is obviously a, a kind of um, um, an appetite for the franchise, which makes me think that Halloween, it will be Halloween ends in brackets for now. But uh, remains to be seen. So... Uh, Okay, well, I guess we can't put it off any longer, Eric. I hope you have an epic. It's my joke of the week. It's so, so fantastic. So did you see the news, guys, that um, Jamie Lee Curtis said that she really wanted, if he was still alive, uh, Bob Hoskins to play the role of Michael Myers? And the people were going to shout, Evil Diets tonight. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my god. Eric. Shut up. <laughs> I want to take communion. But not in my mouth, but down here in my pussy. She's not well, please. Father Conrad. Magdalena, please. You've upset Magdalena now. Well done. Well, Eric, well. Magdalena can tickle my zipper. <laughs> so, um, do we have any feedback, Joseph? I have feedback. But I'm not going to read it out because you were mean to me. Okay. No, I will read it out. Okay, this is from Steve Yacht, and he says, uh, ooh, is he yanking to Raymond Luxury Yacht? That's a Monty Python joke. Um, don't laugh anyway. It's <laughs> mean to me. Gothy Gotherson. Hey guys, just finished your Murder Rock episode. Uh, really enjoyed the discussion along with guest host Gregory Burkhart. Definitely one I need to revisit as I remember absolutely nothing about it. However, something was mentioned that really triggered me. While not a regular occurrence, it does happen on occasion and it's time I finally told you. I'm sorry. As the guy who submitted the listener pick killer workout, I guess that makes me responsible for that awful joke that's made every time it's mentioned. Not kidding, I've watched my VHS countless times and the audio... And the audio is just fine, but so be it. Uh, at first I was offended every time I heard it, and if you, as if you were personally calling me out. How dare you? But now that it's been a few years, I am officially beaten down. I am truly sorry to both you and the entire The Hysteria Continues audience. You win, gentlemen. Good show. Disillusioned and rejected, Steve Yacht. Well, Steve, I've seen, I think, two prints in my lifetime of uh, Killer Workout, a.k.a. Aerobicide, and neither of them have decipherable audio, I'm afraid. Maybe I need to pick up a U US VHS copy. No, because I remember the US VHS copy having the exact same terrible audio. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know what copy he got, but I want it. Mm. I do like the film, though, Steve. I'm not slagging off the film. I'm just slagging off the dreadful copies that we've had to endure. 
Yes, and I think um, Nathan, we'll, we'll be coming on to your uh, your pick for the upcoming drunk cast <laughs> shortly. But I imagine I, is it fair to say, Nathan, that um, your choice is in the same ballpark as Killer Workout? Yes. Well, we'll talk. We'll tease that uh, in, in a well. We'll t- say what that is in a little bit. We'll keep you in suspense. Um, but uh, Joshua, you have directed a slasher movie yourself, haven't you? Uh, yes, actually, I can probably take a couple of minutes to talk about <clears throat> what happened with that. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. So in 2016, I directed a slasher film with a queer bent to it called Kitties. We only had ten thousand dollars Canadian. And it was a lot of fun to make, but like post-production had a lot of problems. It was supposed to be completed in late 2017, but we still had audio issues, and it wasn't really finished until the fall of 2019. Um, we decided to release it online on the 12th of April in 2020, and I guess reception was generally positive, but mixed with like confusion, because um, Cuties is like a combination of classic slasher, but with a send-up of, uh, I guess you'd say, after-school special and coming-of-age vibe. Um, but I didn't want to make a spoof or parody, um, but it was very, like, tongue-in-cheek. Um, I just wanted as little winking to the camera as possible. Um, so sort of in the way people thought Malignant was absurd by accident, even though it was mostly, and I'll say mostly with intention, um, it's more situational humor than punchlines. So at the time, I had noticed a lot of films from Hollywood, um, sort of like Howling Kills, were being a bit heavy-handed with their messages, and I had just entered university, so I'd seen a lot of attempts at art cinema, so we poked fun at like overwrought uh, or like pretentious art films, but I, I may have shot myself in the foot because those who like slashers thought the weird vibe was like way too strange, and those who appreciated the weird comically stuff were like, why do you have to keep stabbing and impaling these characters? <laughs> um, so many thought we were being serious, and but it's all like camp. However, I think Unlike Malignant, since our budget was so low, um, people just assumed it was melodramatic by mistake. So I just thought the world was turning into like a bad movie, and I wanted to exaggerate it as such and express it in my own peachy but like earnest, authentic way. So I guess you'd say it's a commentary of the times, but also maybe more so making light of films that try to be a commentary as well. Um, but I had no idea in 2016 how much more ridiculous films um, of that nature would become in five years' time. And here's where it gets interesting. Um, cut to mid-August 2020, last year, and Netflix blunders their ad campaign for another film called Cuties with uh, provocatively posed and dressed children. Uh, the plot description didn't help much either. And now we had a film with the same title and release year as the most controversial film of the year. Um, and I was worried, but my producer assured me we wouldn't see much backlash. Uh, so IMDb shut down the voting for the other cuties, and we still had ours up for three weeks. Um, the first day, maybe two or three one votes. Second day, like 12. But by the end of the week, we had like over 100 down votes on IMDb and a 1.5. <laughs> um, and our sales had not gone up at all. So, hmm, I wonder what happened. Uh, oh. I pre- yeah, my, my producer also got numerous death threats uh, sent to her social media accounts. So, you know, that's all good fun. Um, I think we're almost at 300 votes now, so maybe we'll edge our way into the bottom 100 one day. Um, <laughs> it's funny in retrospect, um, like that's less than 1% the other cuties got, but I just think like, how, how can that many people not read or like be nefarious enough to do that? But um, I guess it does give the film a weird legacy. <laughs> we tried to get IMDb to reset the votes or pause it and change the incorrect release date, but I guess we weren't high profile enough because they totally ignored our pleas. Um, I think the moral of the story I learned was like, you never know what to expect. Um, I don't know if any distributor of Blu-rays would even be brave enough to touch a film called Cusies right now. Um, I'm pretty sure Altered Innocence does like foreign stuff, but uh, at this point we may just self-release, um, uh, maybe like a couple hundred copies. Um, at least people will accidentally like stumble upon it in years to come if worse comes to works. Uh, it's not currently online, but we may put it back up soon. Uh, it's not a slasher made for everyone for various reasons, but um, I'm proud that we did so much on so little, and uh, a good number of people actually enjoyed it. So yeah, it was a journey. Uh, I can say that. <laughs> um, my next my next one, I'm hoping to have fifty thousand dollars, which is like way more than we had for cuties in. I'm guessing 2023, so hopefully my next slasher will be a little more successful. You're not going to call it Cuties 2. Is um is retroactively changing the title an option, or is that too much 
at this point, I'm like, uh, you know what, just just stick with it. I think at, at this point, I'm just like, you know, what, exposure. Like, mm. if it keeps the title, we'll stick with that. I'm sure, like, I, I don't know. I don't really want to change it to something like Bloody Gaze or something like that. Um, I, I don't know. At this point, I sort of want to partially forget the film, but... Uh, I don't know. I'm still happy it happened. It's just, I, I can laugh at it now, but at the time it was sort of like, oh God, like, I can't believe this is happening. Is it something, I mean, I'm really looking forward to what you do for an, uh, uh, in another slasher movie, but it almost kind of warrants or invites a, um, you to make a, uh, a documentary about your experience with this. Is that something that's ever crossed yeah, your mind? I mean, uh, no, I mean, the, the thing about this is that, like, it was sort of one and done. Like, it's sort of like the wave of people came in a month and it's, it's like it's like a, a bunch of people coming to your house and like destroying everything and then leaving and you're like oh i like it's it's more of like a footnote if anything okay but um yeah yeah this reminds me of the just in the uh you'll probably remember this story from a few years ago there's a, a singer called ian watkins he was the lead singer with a band called lost prophets and he was um he was convicted of pedophilia and sex offenses um, and sent to prison. But there's also another Ian Watkins. He's also known by the nickname H, and he's in a band called Steps, who are this teeny bop, pop, squeaky clean pop group. And he ended up getting tons of death threats and all kinds of horrible things said to him on social media because of, again, people hadn't bothered to do the research to see if they were targeting the right person. It's quite frustrating. Quite frustrating, I imagine, for you, Joshua. It's kind of this crazy position, but there you go. It's in modern life for you so uh okay well um i think we need to find out nathan uh the nathonian is making a comeback is it not it is i will have uh a couple of nathonians for our next episode and i'll tell you what nathan i am going to drink nathonians for the next episode oh well awesome. now I, well now i know what it is so but i will t- i will definitely i shall be drinking sangrias i'm uh, not sangrias um nathonians um and he, this is a film that was delayed a little bit. It was originally your pick. It was going to be a straight pick, for want of a better term. But uh, now it is going to be our national uh, national uh, annual drunk, drunk cast. Um, so can you yes. tell the listeners what it's going to be? It's going to be Last Dance. Uh, the early 90s, 91, 92. Well, I think there's going to be slightly less hot takes on uh, on the, the Last Dance than there maybe was on Halloween Kills. So... So uh, line up your Nathanians and uh, join us to toast the return of Nathan to the podcast. So we're very glad to have Thank you back, you Nathan. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, what are we playing out with? Well, I was thinking of Halloween songs we haven't used. Um, and so I landed on the 1986 cult song, Hollywood Halloween by Paul Bruchek. If you've not heard that, that. No, yeah, if you've not heard that one, look that up on YouTube. It's a interesting little history behind that. Okay, anything left to say? I'll take that as a no. So all we're going to say is uh, goodbye to the good people and thank you for listening. So, uh, yeah, I'll well, catch you next time and uh, we'll raise an Lithonian to you all. So thank you for listening to The Hysteria Continues. Uh, say goodbye to the good people. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Somewhere, somewhere, there are people who strike the pose.